Thank you, Ashley. One of the desires here, one of our uh, statements of vision is that we would capture the hearts of the next generation. One of the things, among the things I like about the next generation is that they're not afraid to ask the questions that have been in the minds of the older generations for a long time, but they've just been afraid to ask. We, uh, a few minutes ago, sang a hymn, and in the hymn, it said, when darkness veils his lovely face. Now, we don't necessarily talk like that anymore, but, you know, what about the times when it seems like God's face is veiled from us? And, uh, you know, we have asked these questions all along. And certainly in prayer, it's one of the times when we grapple with some of the things and we grapple with the idea of prayer to start with. Because is God there anyway? Is he listening? And uh, we're not going to tackle all of that today, but we're going to touch the surface of that, come back to it in the fall again. But I want to look at prayer this morning and uh, come back to a few of the thoughts that were presented in the song that Ashley just sang. Now, get us started. Here's a sign that was out in front of a church just recently. If you're praying for a blizzard, please go to Dairy Queen. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? Huh? Yeah. Yikes. Uh, so, uh, here's what we're going to look at this morning, though. We're going to uh, go into the book of James, and it's chapter 5 we're looking at. If, if you're uh, new with us... Or, you don't have a Bible, that Bible that's in front of you in the, in the pew, that is now yours. Please take it, and you'll find the page, the page number on the screen there will help you find uh, the passage in the scriptures, James chapter 5. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to read verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You may be seated. This last summer, Pamela and I, or this last September, Pamela and I were in Tennessee, stayed at a nice bed and breakfast there, and this bed and breakfast was located on uh, a lot of acreage. I can't remember how many acres, but it was rather huge, and there was, uh, I'll call them mountains, probably, I guess, uh, since it was Tennessee, well, maybe, I don't know if you want to call it hills or mountains, but I prefer to call it a mountain because I hiked up this big hill. And uh, there was a, a mile hike going up. And, and the reason I was uh, going up there is that I had heard that at the top of that mountain were highland cattle. I don't even know what, I didn't know what highland cattle were. So I, I thought I've got I've to see these things because it seemed to be the big talk of the bed and breakfast. So I hiked up one afternoon. And uh, as I got to the top, I noticed that there were, uh, for the guests of the bed and breakfast, there were, <laughs> there were bags of alfalfa. That wasn't for the guests of the bed and breakfast, but it was for us to use in feeding these highland cattle. So I, I poured out a, a bag into the, the trough, and the first one over comes the bull. And uh, he moved in, 
and ate all of the alfalfa in the trough. And, and when he was done with that, uh, with his, now, do you call them horns, right? I, I'm a Chicago kid. I don't know. that Those are the horns, right? And they're not, it's antlers on deer, right? And then these are horns, right? He, you know, knocked that, tried to knock the trough over in order to eat the, the feed that had fallen onto the ground. So he was making sure he got his plenty. Now, while that's going on, the, uh, I'll assume it was the mom uh, came over, his, uh, this bull's dear wife, and she uh, tried to move in to the trough to get some of the feed. And husbands, I would advise, do not try this at home. What this bull did with his horns was just, boom, head-butted this uh, dear mother out of the way. And she had no access to that trough. And then I looked over, and there were two others there, and I assumed they were the daughters. And they didn't even try to get near the trough. It's like they'd tried this before, and it doesn't work. So they just stood off to the side. But I noticed as I watched them, drool was just coming out. I mean, a stream all the way to the ground. They were just salivating like crazy. And I thought to myself, this whole time I'm thinking, I've never done anything like this before. And, and, and then I realized, I've never seen anything like this before. I, I was a, a city kid, and I haven't had any exposure to a farm, so this is all new to me. Never, I've never seen a bull headbutt the others out of the way and indulge, and others do not get what's rightfully theirs. And then I realized I have seen this before. Not with animals, but with people. I, I have seen people, um, privileged people, indulge with no awareness of the marginalized, lesser privileged people around them. I, I have seen people, I would have to say, even emotionally or financially headbutt the less fortunate out of the way. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, hmm, maybe even in the church I've observed this a bit. And as I prepared for this series, I realized that, yes, it does go on in the church. Uh, you know, if, if you struggle with God because of this type of stuff going on in the church, because of the hypocrisy, don't let your struggle be with God. Let it be with the hypocrites. That's okay. But don't let it be with God because God's right open with us. Uh, he informs us of this malady that can occur even among professing Christians. He puts it right out there. But he does so in, in stern warning as well. James has been dealing with several themes, as we've seen, that relate to, that are connected with relationship. And, and one of them is, you know, how do the, those with wealth and those in poverty, how do they work with each other? And we've looked at that in this series. And we've seen how these themes cycle around. He comes back to those three themes throughout, that of poverty and wealth being one of those. And in chapter 5, he comes back to it one last time. So before we come back to the verses I just read, I want us to see the context. In verse 1 of chapter 5, speaking to the highland cattle of people, James said, Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth is rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. 
The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and you have murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. You know, you're doing this not to the people who are giving you a difficult time. You're doing this to people who aren't even opposing you. So James gives this warning to the church one last time in this letter about the use of their wealth. And from there, he goes into the passage that we're looking at today. Here's what I I believe James is bringing to our attention in this contrast. That rather than being a community of indulgence, we are to be a community of care. Because that's what verses 13 and 20 are all about. He's reminding us that this matter of relationship with one another is a matter of the heart. Relationships are a heart issue. And as we've been going through this series, noting concepts of relationships in James, we've been noting that though this series has considered some communication techniques, it's been more about the condition of the heart, our heart's condition before God. And the condition of my heart with God impacts the connection I have with other people, the health of my relationships with others. We've seen that there's a lot of internal stuff we've had to deal with here so that it doesn't spill out and infect our relationships with others. And now James calls us to be a caring community rather than the indulgence to be caring And in this passage, he calls us to care for others by connecting with God and connecting with God through prayer. He's going to be talking to us about praying for each other. But it's all about connecting with God so that I can care for others. This morning at the uh, end of the service, I I want us to know that we'll have an opportunity. There'll be a team that comes forward here at the end of the service in the closing song. And if you want someone to be praying with you, They're going to be here. And and I'm so thankful for how uh, this has become becoming a norm for us to have these opportunities. And today it will be at the end. Perhaps you want to experience that care in having someone else pray along with you. I'm looking at three principles this morning of prayer. They're 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 simple. Um, There's so much more that could be said, but I don't want to miss the obvious here and start out with that. First of all, prayer is the proper response to every event in life. It's the proper response to every event in life. In verses 13 and 14, here's what James says. Hey, any of you uh, experiencing some trouble right now? And, you know, he kind of waits, show of hands. Then he says, hey, any of you happy right now? Show of hands. Yeah, there's a few, all right. Hey, any of you happen to be sick? Show of hands. Yeah. That's what he does in verses 13 and 14. And by the time he asks those three questions, I would think every hand is up. You know? Who's left? And he's telling us here that that's, in each case, we are to pray because prayer is the proper response to anything that's going on in our life. Now, duh, you know, we want that to be obvious, but we all know that too many of us have the tendency to use prayer only in panic situations. But if our our praying, if it is crisis-driven, the problem with that is that once the crisis is over, so is the motivation to pray. And prayer is all about just talking with God. So, you know, how would any of us feel if the only time somebody came to talk to us was when they were experiencing a problem? I mean, that actually becomes offensive after a while. And God says, look, I want to... I want to be chatting with you all the time. So if you're in trouble, if you're happy, if you're sick, hey, come talk. And James here is writing about what so many of the other New Testament writers spoke of. Same thing. Peter said it this way, cast all your anxiety upon God because he cares for you. Um, Paul, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, said pray continually. I mean, that pretty much says it. 
And then when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, he said, Pray all the time. Ask God for anything in line with the Holy Spirit's wishes. Plead with him, presenting your needs. And keep praying earnestly for all people everywhere. So I learned from this that we are to pray for everything and about anything. It's conversation with God. It's not complicated to do. Now the second thing that James points out is that prayer is a group effort. You know, there are some, boy, this is an old one here, Lone Ranger, but I think the term is still used a little bit. Lone Ranger means you just do this all by yourself, and there are some Lone Ranger Christians. You know, you just, you probably haven't, you've probably just kind of kept to yourself pretty much the whole week, and, and that's not how God intended us to, to walk in the Christian life. None of, us can, none of us can do this thing alone. We try, but it doesn't work. And and here, James identifies the involvement of many people. In in verse 14, he said, you know, if you're sick, call for the elders. Bring in that group. Call for the elders to pray for you. And though this message is not zeroing in on on that offer and invitation, I I don't want to pass it by without reminding us that this is what we practice here in this church. Someone came up after the first service, and we'll be calling the elders for them to to pray for them is it a magical thing no but it's a design of God that that's how he wants to do his work through a group why do we anoint with oil it's symbolic as you go through scriptures just quickly it's symbolic of the touch of God on our life nothing about the oil itself symbolic But it involves others coming into our life. And then, in verse 16, it expands out even further. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. This is the whole group. This is all of us involved here. Because it's a group effort. Now, I realize there's some things that we're very uncomfortable letting others know about. And and some things that discretion would say, yeah, you just don't lay that out there for everybody. But at the same time, we must also be aware that God has called us to live life with transparency. You know, what draws me to songs like we heard during the offertory is, is it's an openness, it's a transparency of, hey, here's where I'm struggling. Here's the questions I have about God. Here's where I'm struggling. And scripture encourages us towards this transparency. So we want to be moving in that direction. James, back in chapter 4, verse 10, said, humble yourselves. And that transparency is the willingness to, you know what, I'm going to take off all the facade here, and here's, here's what's going on for me. Here's where I'm struggling. And that's to take off all the pretenses. I'm not trying to have you think a certain way about me. I'm just saying, this is where I struggle. Here's the dark side. And James says, Humble yourself. Be transparent. And the reason I believe is because the experience of God's power in our life appears to be in proportion to our willing expression of our weakness to others. There appears to be a connection between those two. Back again in James chapter 4, verse 6, James said, He gives more grace. You know, in those situations where we are transparent, where we do share our struggles, he gives more grace, verse 6. And that is why the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. It's hard to get through the spiritual thick skin of the proud. But the humble, there's an openness, and God can penetrate that, and he penetrates it with his power. And so Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, He said, I tell you, if two of you will agree on earth about anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Here's what I think that's about. It's not just, okay, the more people we get, the more we'll twist God's arm here. I don't think that's it. I think it speaks about unity, two or three gathered together, unified in something, because God's all about unity, and transparency. If we're going to pray together, we're going to be talking to each other about what's going on, what our needs are. It's a group effort. Um, 
Richard Foster, he's written several books on prayer and that type of topic. And in one of his books, and there's a chapter, he talks about a young girl who was in a serious auto accident. And as a result, a severe brain injury. She was in the hospital. And Foster called together some of her friends who were fellow students. He called them together and he said, I want you to pray for her. But I don't want you to just, you know, do a nice little prayer that, you know, you think God will be able to answer. I want you to really trust him. I want you to pray for a miracle. I want you to pray specifically that the capillaries in her brain will heal. I want you to pray specifically that the swelling of that brain will go down because she was in critical condition. And he talks in that chapter about how in a week's time this gal was released from the hospital with an obvious work of God in her brain. And he attributes that to the fact that there were people who were really devoted to trusting God as a group and and praying this student through that critical time. As I read that, I thought, my goodness. Because if you've been here six months, you know we've gone through the same thing here. Katrina wasn't out in a week's time, but the fact that she's gotten out from her critical severe brain injury, the fact that there's anticipation of her returning to school is a God thing. And we can praise the Lord that he allowed us to be part of the group that has prayed for her and seen that God does work. We will experience God's power in our life to the extent that we make ourselves transparent to others. There's one last thing. Prayer is something we do all the time. It's a group effort, and prayer makes a difference. In verse 15, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Wow. Now there's a bold statement. So if you're like me and our little bit of cynicism and sarcasm, we say, well, then why isn't everybody healed? Why aren't all my prayers answered? When it comes to prayer, many of us would uh, love to tell God what to do in any given situation. And in fact, many of us do exactly that. We tell God what to do. Here, God, here's what you do in this situation. And uh, we want to be assured that he will follow our directions. That's what we want. Every one of us falls into that category. Can't avoid that. But that isn't how prayer works. And you've probably discovered that. You know, although the Bible gives this bold promise regarding prayer, we, we must not let ourselves give into, the, give into the temptation of thinking that God has turned over, surrendered the control of the universe to us. We should not give in to that temptation. But when we think God should answer prayer according to how we have voiced it, we're actually thinking, God, I'd really prefer that you surrender control to me and just do what I say, please. That's not prayer. I mean, we sang earlier about God Almighty, uh, great and holy. So it's not like we come to him with our list and he follows our orders or else he's not God. Uh, Prayer is something greater than that. We need to keep in mind that prayer comes down to something different. It's a different reason, and and that is this. It's, It's just depending on God, communicating with and depending on God. And sometimes he'll let our faith be stretched in that exercise. The song that Ashley sang, one of the phrases out of there, were you in the fire or did you pass by? And you know what, isn't, isn't that the way it is? A lot of times, like I said, we're praying because there's a crisis, so we're in the fire. And there are times we wonder if God's there because as the old hymn writer wrote, God seems to veil his face. Again, he's honest with us. 
God, were you there in the fire? Now, he promised he would be. Isaiah said, when I go through the fire, when I go through the flood, you're there. But there's times it seems like he's passing us by. There are times we, we pray for a miracle. There's most of the time when we pray for something that we think God can handle. We don't always pray for the miracle. Here, I'll trust God for this because I think he can handle this. Once in a while, if we're really desperate, we go for the miracle. And when God answers that miracle, when he actually does as we asked, we, we say, wow. You know, we, we would say, I saw God's hand. Now, there's not an actual hand, but that's to say, I saw God at work. Wow, God, it was really at work. And then there's other times when we pray for the miracle and God does something different and sometimes entirely different. And we wonder, where is God? Where is his hand? We don't necessarily get to see his hand. But here's what we see. It's at that time we get to see his grace. And what do I mean by that? Well, we see his grace in spite of the fact that the circumstances may continue to seem that it's against us, but God has a way of providing for us in that circumstances, whereby as we get further down the road, we look back and we say, how did you do that, God? How did you get me through that? You got me through it. There's a way in which he extends his grace, and oftentimes it comes through the care of others who have come alongside of us. That's why this truth is so important as James presents it. That's why he is so against the indulgence that goes on because he knows that God uses this caring community to often extend his grace. Because if God always did the circumstantial thing, we would begin trusting the circumstances and God wants us to trust him. And to know that he is above the circumstances and how he might provide for our lives. You see, in either case, whether he does the miracle as we thought and wished he would, or he sends his grace, in either case, he's drawing us to himself and he does it as a group. So we are drawn together in community to pray for one another and to care for one another. My, my prayer is that we would be a culture of prayer here. That we would be a people who not only talk about how we're doing, but that we would together be talking to God about how we're doing. Remember last week, I, I think it was last week, in, in the message on relationship then, I, I talked about how sometimes we uh, resent when others succeed. But the culture of prayer here is not to become self-indulgent, but rather that when others succeed, we join with them and we give thanks to the Lord. Hey, I'm still looking for a job, but I'm glad you got one. Can I just pray with you right now and give thanks to God so it's two of us thanking him? Scriptures say rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. But when God brings someone else to rejoice with us, it strengthens us. God knows it's best done in a group. Sometimes we get thrown off by that verse. It says uh, the prayer of the righteous man is powerful and effective. And there's a lot of us that just don't feel like that righteous person. Uh, don't, don't read too much into it. Yes, you know, we do need to be right with God and willing that through our praying our minds will be brought into conformity with his will. That's what it would mean, that we're thinking as God would think about this situation. That is important. But let's not allow the enemy of our soul to cause us to refrain from prayer because we don't think we're good enough. Keep in mind what James went right on to say right after that verse. He talked about Elijah. Elijah was this like this really big holy guy. But what did James say? Hey, he was human. He had a dark side too. He was human just like us. James reminds us right in that context that this isn't about just the super spiritual person who prays. It's every one of us who comes dependent before God, allowing our minds to be conformed to him and trusting him. 
And as we do this together as a caring community, we build relationship together. We've been using the road construction metaphor in this series, and we've talked about how to fill the potholes. We've talked about the detours and all that stuff. But this last passage reminds us that we are together. We are building the road together. We are caring for one another, building that road of caring together, and the best way to do it is by connecting with God on behalf of each other through prayer. So last September, I'm looking at those drooling cattle. Man, my heart went out to them. You know, I don't know what you're supposed to think when, you know, if you're an actual cattle rancher. I I don't know. But here's what I thought. I want to get them some food. So I distracted the bull, got another bag of alfalfa, spread it out on the ground so they could eat. And in realizing that it's people that indulge and headbutt just as much as bulls, I, I said, God, you know, can't do much for these cattle, but whatever you want to do to use me for the people around me, um, I, I want to be part of that. And as we look at this truth this morning, I believe what God is saying is, I've given you this feed, it's called prayer. And I want you to pray for one another. I want you to pray for everybody. I want you to pray for anybody. I want you to pray in every situation, but make sure you do it together. And our opportunity this morning is to experience that. But I trust it's not just at the front here. I really love how... uh, There's times out in the lobby. Uh, I'll see a couple people just praying, stopping right there. Here's what I think. uh, Here's here's, uh, two things to keep in mind. One is pause. Pause. We get into these conversations and we forget to pause and say, you know what, that's something we can pray about right now. Just pause right there and pray. That's one thing. And the second thing is the prompting. When God prompts you to pray, pray. Because there's a reason he's prompting us. Somebody just shared with me, they hadn't even been into this service yet, to, they, about the sermon, but they heard it was about prayer. And they, they shared something with me about how God had prompted uh, one person to pray for the other. And it was, is, as the story unfolded, it was a purposeful prompting. So understand, God wants us to pause. And when he prompts us to pray, he's got something going on. He's got something in mind. And it would be foolish for us to miss out on it. James said, be like Elijah. Recognize the prompting is for God's purpose, that he's at work. And he wants to include you in it because prayer is a group thing. Let's pray together right now. Father, would you uh, take these next few moments? There's some here who are troubled. Some are happy. Some are ill. And you've told us in every situation, pray. And I thank you for those who will be at the front and ready to pray with others. And I pray that we would weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.